Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're joined by Mr. Lars Lentz on the Complete German Shepherd podcast. Lars Lentz is not uh, somebody, uh, whoever is involved in the Schutzen world, has very much a clue who Mr. Lentz is. He is a tracker extraordinaire. He's represented his country in the World Championship. And today, he joins us to share his wisdom. So, Mr. Lentz, welcome. Thank you very much. So, first things first, I want to ask you about your mascot. Well, it's a little bit funny story. Uh, during the COVID crisis, I could not travel, have seminars. So some people uh, almost forced me to make online lessons. And it was very difficult because my lack of language. So I need to show something on the screen. And then one of my grandkids have a toy on the tape on the floor playing with that. And I took that and that was a rat, a stupid rat. And I have to show something like a dog with it. So it was better for people to understand. And then suddenly people start making that rat to a kind of marketing for me. They make t-shirts and stickers. And you can see behind me uh, pictures from Australia, <laughs> from actually from uh, the Aboriginals that make that. The other one is from Norway with lighting. The oh, other, other one is an oil point painting. It's very funny, actually, because I think, and that's actually very important for me in dog sport, we need to bring the smile and the fun into the 100%. sport. hundred percent. I agree with you, yeah. definitely. And it's so memorable. I mean, it's and the best marketing is always, or the best moments that are memorable are always the one that happens spontaneously. Exactly, exactly. So that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. So I want yeah, to ask you first. First of all, I want to ask you what inspired you to become involved with German Shepherd Dog Breed. What inspired you to start IGP, and how did you become a competitor at the world level when you did? Well, first of all, uh, as a child, I didn't have any dogs. I didn't know anything about dogs. And uh, when I, I have learned my wife, when I know her, uh, we was very, very young and we moved in our first place and she would like to have a dog. And then German Shepherd was the most popular dog in Denmark at that time. So we were buying one of those dogs. And OK, then we have to train with it and we go to training with the dog. And then I was hooked. So I start training with the dog and, and very fast I find out that uh, you can compensate for lack of talent with hard work. And uh, <laughs> I have no talent for anything, but I'm very hardworking and I have a lot of discipline. So that was very nice for me. So I could very fast get better results because I was working very hard. That's awesome. That's wonderful. Could you please tell us about the first experiences that you had in the sport and the group of people that helped you helped elevate you into the sport? Yeah, it is like that in Denmark. Uh, all the clubs is it's they are compared to other country I've been in. In Denmark, the clubs is everybody is volunteer there. Uh, money is not involved in the sport. We are uh, organization organization under the German Shepherd Club, which is under Danish Kennel Club. And I was joining one of those local clubs, and I was very lucky. There were some people who was a little bit like me on the same level. And uh, we was getting along with each other very good and trying to learn. And in the old days, 40 years ago, there was not so much uh, knowledge to get and there was no internet, there was no computers, there was no nothing. So we was trying the best we could to find some videotapes from Germany and from United States and try to figure them out to PAL version to, so we could watch them on Danish television and learn the German language and the English language to understand what was going on. So that was it. And how the tables have turned and now everybody in America is seeking out Mr. Lars Lentz. Mm, well, I think it's because of all the social media. Uh, I've been in sport for 40 years. I've uh, competed a lot. And uh, when, when I start uh, tracking with my dog without lease, I make a lot of point that way. It was a little bit spectacular for people. Yeah. And when you start seeing that on social media, people is reaching out for you. And then I was starting making seminars for, let's say, seven, eight years ago. And then it just grow from there, more or less. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I assume your fa favorite phase is tracking. Yes. Uh, yeah. What I like about tracking is that you can do it yourself. There's no yep. excuses. Right. Uh, everybody's yelling and screaming about we don't have any helpers and we need a help and blah blah blah. But hey, you can at least make sure that your track is good. And until now, I've not seen any dogs who cannot learn to track. So that's true. Yeah. So would you please expand on that when you say a lot of people say, oh, this dog doesn't have any natural talent to track. He doesn't have this or he doesn't have that. To those people who are saying that, 
oh, this XYZ is a low drive dog. I'm not saying, you know, any bloodline or any particular dog, just saying dog X is supposedly the owner say the dog has no talent for tracking. He doesn't have any food drive or he doesn't have any will to hunt something like that. How would you say what makes tracking phase so special that this dog will also track? I mean, of course, we have to admit some dog is more difficult than other dog to teach them to of track. Course. Like is everything in life. Exactly. But nevertheless, uh, I think we have to pay respect to people who's training with the dog in front of them instead of all the time telling them, buy another dog. And that's a shitty dog and that's a stupid dog. I, I don't like yeah. that. I agree. And I have to say, until now, I have not seen one single dog who could not learn to track. Uh, because, well, we are, we are I'm building the foundation on the track uh, around food drive. And even if the dog have very, very, very low food drive, we can, if we do it properly, build up the food drive, the small part of food drive that is in the dog. Because a lot of people are saying, my dog have no food drive. Yes. Well, sorry to say, your dog is not dead. <laughs> so there is some I agree. food drive. There is some food <laughs> yes. drive. Maybe it's not a lot, but there is some food drive. Maybe it's low, but it's there. So yes. then we can build it up and build it up and build it up. Yes. And can you tell me uh, what would describe or the, what would be the characteristics of a German Shepherd dog amongst others that make it more suited for the not only the sport of IGP, but particularly tracking? Uh, well, since I've been so blessed to travel around the world, I've seen a lot of different breed tracks. I will say, I don't think the German Shepherd is tracking better than other dogs. Not at all. Sure. I don't think the nose is better. But sure. uh, what I what I really like around the German Shepherd is that the German Shepherd uh, is easier for me to cooperate, to work with. I mean, a lot of other breed, I don't want to mention names because then people start yelling and screaming, but sure. a lot of them don't want to cooperate with you. I mean, you right. have the dog you have here, and if you want to change that dog a little bit, the dog wants to escape or attack you. They, they sure. don't want to talk with you, uh, be on the same level, which the German Shepherd very often is very much easy to communicate with. Sure. It's an intuitive and, dog that wants to uh, work with you and be right for you. The exactly. innate characteristic of a working dog. Yes. And, and at the same time, I have been so blessed. I have traveling around uh, breeding with a lot of the, the most important dogs for 40 years, working yes. lines. So I know a lot of German Shepherd dogs are in, in the breeding program from Germany and all over Europe. So I'm blessed with that. And, 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 and that gives me some, uh, some better ideas and knowledge about which is good and what is bad uh, regarding to health and uh, ability to work and all that. Right. And what do you think makes those dogs special or more willing to work as opposed to others? Not just outside, outside of the characteristic of, let's say, just being... Huh, how, how should I put it? If the dog is able to cooperate with you, like you said, to learn from you and to work with you, what other things about drive or drive states or hunt drive or what other things are present in the dog, in a high level dog that you like for yourself, let's say, that uh, make that dog special? Uh, that's individual. But for me, I like yes. a dog who is not too hard. Sure. Uh, I like soft dog who's a little bit nervy because sure. it's easier for me to work with. Sure. Uh, I mean, if define I define can... nervy, define nervy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's very uh, delicate to talk about because a lot of people think that's negative, but because, but for me, that's uh, if we talk about stress, for me, there's yes. a lot of positive things about stress. Sure. I mean, the dog who really wants to uh, cooperate with me and wants to please me, I like those kind of dog. The dog is, uh, I don't know what to say, being a little bit afraid of the train when it's a puppy or an airplane, it doesn't affect me. When a lot of yeah. people, they want a strong, mental strong dog who's not afraid of that. I don't care about that because I'm very good to build that dog up. And those dogs very often have a lot of drive and passion. They want to please you a lot. Uh, and I yeah. really prefer those kind of dogs. So we're talking about handler stress and handler sensitivity and environmental stress. Yeah. 
But but at the same time, when they are one years old, they have to be very stable for me, of course. So sure, um, absolutely. Do, so when I have a puppy, I'm spending a lot of time taking them with the bus and the train station and all that, so the dog gets good in the environment. Wonderful. So we're certainly not talking about bad dogs, not at all. Yes, and very yes. often when I see other people, I say, mm, maybe I have another point of view than you have when I say nervous compared to what you mean about nervous. Right, so, that's why I wanted to clarify. Yeah, it's very delicate to yeah. talk about. Uh, absolutely. And uh, what are the fundamentals and techniques that you employ uh, for, let's say, a puppy to introduce it to foundation of tracking? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, for me, it is like, First of all, we have to understand, it's only my opinion we are talking about here, but, but for me, ITP sport is a circus. Uh, in the beginning, it was a breeding program. It's not so much anymore. It's more a little, mm -hmm. bit, a bit, a little bit more like sport. Yes. And, and, and because it is like that, it is, it is a circus. It's an illusion. I mean, in protection yes. work, we send the dog around blinds where there's not a helper. The dog knows exactly where the helper is. But the dog yeah. has to look inside the blind anyway. We put yes. a ball there. The dog looks yes. for the ball. And the judge says, oh, nice, the dog is looking for the helper. I mean, we know it's an a, a illusion. Uh, yes. and, and, and I love it. Don't misunderstand me. I love it. No, no. And it's the same in, in, in obedience. I mean, if you make the send out, could you imagine just one time the judge was saying to you, oh, please make the send out the other direction. <laughs> you will not be able to do it because it's an illusion we have built up that system after the dumbbell run to the end the foot the soccer goal there will be a reward for you yes but the interesting part for me is on track people don't see dog training the same way and i was not doing that for many years i mean in track people put food on the ground and so the dog pick up the food and then we hope the dog will do the same after a long time when we take the food away and follow the scent of the disturbance of the surface. But for yes. me, it's not so much about that. For me, it's more like continue building up that circus dog and illusion. I mean, mm -hmm. I go to a lot of competition, listen carefully to what is it the judge wants to see. And then I go home in my laboratory and teach my dog the behavior that the judge wants to see. Sure. And then we could discuss, is my dog tracking? Mm, I don't know, but I'm getting a lot of point. Because, I mean, if the dog is tracking like that and all the footprint, you will get yes. a lot of points. Absolutely. But then again, how many dogs in the real life would track that way? Nobody. Zero. No police dog will track like that. The police dog will maybe no. have to know so much about the ground and like that. Very, very effective. But they will yes. never get any point for ITP. Yes. So, I mean, the first step is to admit it's a circus. It's an illusion. We are building up yep. a dog to a certain job, which is yep. much more for me a muscle memory than search. Yes. I mean, uh, when people are showing up to me and they say, oh, I have a naturally good tracker. Mm -hmm. Sorry to say, I don't care. Because yeah. even <laughs> if I get a naturally good tracker, I need to literally take the skull off and put everything in the brain where I want it to be and put the yes. skull back on and show it to the judge. Look, because yes. it's an unnaturally behavior the judge wants to see. Everything is unnatural about this. Nothing is natural. Yeah. No. But yeah. I like it. Don't misunderstand it. And yeah. the reason why I say that is I see a lot of old grumpy men, especially in Europe, sitting and say, oh, it was better in the old days. Yeah, but yes. hey, come on. Then leave the sport. Do something else with your life. Yeah. Stay in the sport and take the challenge. Uh, sorry to say. I love it. I love it. No, this is, this is brilliant. Uh, my my uh, two things uh, that I would maybe like to add something would be the dog must also have innate hunt drive uh, uh, along with the obedience drive that we're teaching as muscle memory for the dog to keep continuing and not quitting on the track for that hope to go to the end. Would that be a thing you would agree with or would you like to uh, unpack that? Yeah, you, you are right about that. But I think we need not so much as people is talking about. I think yes. if we only are able to use the small thing that is in the dog, we can easily, easily do it. What I mean about that is, uh, if you talk about obedience and protection work, uh, some dog is not good at that. Some dog yes. is afraid of the stick. That's how it is. And some dog yes. of course. plays in obedience or don't want to cooperate. But I yes. mean, all dog have a very, very strong nose. Yes. Send them smell. I mean, uh, you, you know, all the, your clients know stories about what dog is able to do with the nose. Uh, yeah. And that's amazing. I mean, uh, I was in Finland 
two years ago having a seminar. And when I landed in the airport, there was Doc who identified coronavirus in the airport. And I mean, whoa, that's amazing. The dog is yeah. a little bit better than the test. And you, all of us know stories about dog can indicate coronavirus, cancer, diabetes. Yeah. And then explosive narcotics. Small, 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 small pieces. Yeah. And then yeah. our dog have problem about finding such a big article. I mean, there's something wrong in what we are doing traditional. That's that's my right. point of view. Yes. I, I, I mean, and, and, and I don't know in your country, but in my country, it is like that. Uh, if I buy a puppy for ITP sport and it turns out to be not so good as I expect, I sell it to the stupid policeman. <laughs> and then one year later, the dog can find small, small pieces of the cards again, explosive and, and, and blood and sperm. What's going on? I, I, I think <laughs> there's something wrong in what we're doing in our track in ITP sport. I think so too, yes. I because agree. The jo- I, I mean, honestly, I'm not Dr. Doolittle, but I guess I could go to the car when I have layer track, and then I could open and ask my dog, and my dog could already from the car tell me where the three article is. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful, yeah. We have uh, 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 an exercise like this where you just toss the three articles out and the dog must just go without following footsteps, indicate where the article is. Yeah. There is such a exercise. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I mean, our dog have so much talent compared to what we expect of them for IGP sports. Yes. Yes. So I think it's 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 a bad. Um, um, we bad already excuse. know that we already know the test. It's already written. Just prepare yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It is actually very easy. But I think one of the biggest issues we have is when we train too easy, the dog get lazy and unfocused yeah. and unconcentrated, and then the dog make mistakes. Yes. And then I have a question about focus. This is like on a side tangent from what we were talking about about hunting. So. A lot of judges talk about seeing a picture. I mean, that's, of course, it's also personal preference. They talk about a dog being stressed when the tail is not going frantically like this is. They say, oh, no, the dog is not happy. The dog is stressed. Maybe that's just how the dog likes to hunt. Yeah. And maybe he uh, never shook his tail as a puppy. Who, who knows? Yeah. It, it's up to the dog. And then you can get penalized for something like this. Yeah. And personally, for me, talking about how the tail is acting is stupid. Yeah, I've I seen attack, I've seen dog being excited with the tail totally down, and I've yep. seen dog being under pressure with the Nervous. tail on the back. So, yep. so you cannot. But I also have to say that good judges on high level, they are not only looking at the tail; right. they are looking no, no, at absolutely. the complete picture. So, honestly, yes. I pay a lot of respect to the judges on high level in the in the, yes. in our club. I think they are good to judge is the dog under pressure or not. No, absolutely. No, 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 for sure. I'm not talking about the yeah. high-level judges. I'm talking no, no, about, no. you know. Yeah. But, but yes, uh, you're right. Sometimes we hear that story. Oh, the dog's not working with the tail. The dog's not happy. <laughs> yeah. Similarly in obedience too, but, you know, that's another can of worms. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And could you please tell me what, from all the buildup of your uh, tracking career or your IGP career from the very inception, what would be the most memorable story for your personal success? Uh, well, I have made a lot of point, uh, but, but I will say that um, I was having a dog uh, where I was, I, was, I was become very, very cocky and very smart ass. My head was growing, growing and growing because I think I, I know everything. Uh, sure. So it was very much like, hey, step aside, the king is coming. And I'm embarrassed <laughs> to talk about that, uh, but I thought I was the king of everything. And I sure. go to the Danish national with a dog named Jabina Gustav, and uh, I make six points on track. <laughs> and uh, But the funny part was, if you have been an arrogant bastard, sorry to say, like I have been for 15 years maybe, it doesn't affect you. Because if you one time make six points, it's like, <laughs> it's certainly not my mistake. It must be the judge or the track layer or the feel or the weather <laughs> or the birds. You know, those kind of bad excuses. Yes. But uh, I was invited uh, three months later to the United States to a big private competition there named World Dog Masters Tournament. Sure. And I, I was going to the track field exactly the same way. Eric and me, sorry to say, step aside, the king is coming. And then I make 21 point. That hurts. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts. But there, then there is, uh, in Germany, there was uh, there's a very, very famous dog kennel named the uh, Dr. Helmut Reiser. Yes. For me, he's the godfather of protection work. He's the man who yes. invented 
if you ask me. Yeah, yes. I'm, I'm a big fan of him. Uh, and uh, I was joining him and tracking with him and got a lot of inspiration from him on track. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. with the, exactly the same dog, which I make six and 21 point with, then 10 months later, I was coming back with that dog, going to the Danish Nationals and make 100 point without a lease. Beautiful. So, so that was quite dramatic, going from 621 and then 100 without lease. And that's you can amazing. say that that was actually how I started my career as a trainer because people start, of course, questioning me, hey, what have changed? Yes. And then I look back and say, yeah, what have actually changed? And that was dramatically for me to see what have changed compared to what Absolutely. I have done traditional training and what I'm doing now. Yeah. So how would you unpack the then versus now? Uh, uh, I think it's important that that first of all that we admit. I mean, if, if you look at the score to a big national competition the last ten years, compared to for twenty or thirty years ago, we are getting less and less and less point on track. Mm-hmm. I mean, between uh, twenty five and thirty percent of all the tracks to the world championship is failure. Sure. And I mean, to the world championship, the track is actually quite short. Yeah, and 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 the interesting part for me is also track is the only discipline where we have not changed anything the last fifty yes. years. Track yes. is exactly the same. The other discipline we have changed a lot, but maybe only the shape of the track. articles. Maybe only the yeah, articles. Yeah, but uh, yeah, small small yeah. details. But that's it. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's still six hundred fifty paces long, four corners, blah blah blah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we get less less point. And I think it's interesting that nobody, sorry, a lot of people is not changing the way they are training. They are still sure. doing the same training, but now they get disappointed about getting the same stupid score. And I mean, a lot of dog trainers is. 100 times smarter than I am in obedience and protection work, but why don't they take that knowledge and bring them to the track? I feel personally attacked. (laughs) Let me give you a good example. (laughs) If you train protection work, if you have a dog who has some issue inside the blind, the dog is biting in the sleeve, one day we decide uh, we will stop that behavior. And that's a lot of... uh, way to fix that problem but let's say people is putting a long leash on the dog and a prong collar and want to tell sure. the dog now you have to behave yes you have probably seen if it's an intelligent trainer he is not doing that inside the blind he is doing no. that outside the blind yep away from the blind for sure why do we don't create the problem in the blind exactly the dog doesn't Exactly. And I think that is brilliant. That's very clever dog training. But the yep. same smart dog trainer he don't have any problem about correcting his dog in the corner on the track. Right. And I mean, the corner is the same for me as the blind. Mm-hmm. Because if I correct my dog in the corner, next time my dog approaches the corner and the dog can probably smell the corner 20 paces before it show up. Oh my God, yep. the corner is coming. <laughs> yep. Now the dog starts getting nervous, hectic, avoiding yep. uh, whatever stress because he's going in the corner. And, and imagine... Compare those two exercises, the blind and the corner. In the blind, yeah. I would prefer to fix the problem there because the drive is high and the reward is high. On yes. track, the drive is low and the reward is yes. low. It's difficult yes. to remove it, uh, the bad behavior yeah. on the track. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think very often, why don't we take the knowledge we have from obedience and put it on the track? Like how? Please expand on that. That's a good example. Like... Uh, maybe you should fix that problem in the corner, not in the corner, but out of the yeah. corner. And okay, why is the dog having a problem with a corner? Yeah. Because the dog is not tracking. Okay, Absolutely. maybe we should teach the dog to track before we introduce the corner to the dog. Yes. Uh, a good example is um, if, if um, you're healing with your dog in obedience and you think now the healing is good, very yes. often, be very fast, put some uh, stress on the dog. People is making noises on yeah, the side yeah, of yeah. the dog. The dog look away. We correct the dog and we reward the dog. Yeah. So the dog is gaining more and more focus on the dog handler. One correction, one reward. Yes. Why don't we do that much more on track? On yeah. the straight out leg, put a um, lot of distraction on the side so the dog look at them, correct the dog for look at them. When the dog go back on the track, reward for that. Sure. I mean, uh, and, and another thing which I, I, I don't understand that is when people is tracking, 
and and please remember it's only my yes. my ideas when people is your to... that's what we are here for we are here for your ideas yeah. 99% of all the people I'm seeing tracking for competition, they have the lease and they put the lease underneath the front legs, underneath the belly and track like this. Tuk, 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 yes. Tuk, tuk. yes. Why are they doing that? Why are they putting the lease there? To create uh, a version for the dog to put its head down. Oh, that's, yeah, counterintuitive. Yeah, but if we do that, that is false. We are forcing the head down. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's counterintuitive to natural and behavior. Have... And I, yes, but have you never heard about the opposite reflex of the least pressure? That, that's what I'm saying. That we use it in obedience all the time to create the opposite reflex for stand, yeah. for set, for down. Yeah. And we're doing it to make it worse for the tracking. Yeah, but if we get the, the wrong result then on track. Yeah. I, I mean, if you have a male dog and you rest that dog before you go to sleep, the dog has to pee and poo, and the dog is sniffing around in the ground, and suddenly the dog stops and sniffs yep. very intensely, start drooling yes. from the nose, the mouse. Yeah, there have been in heat there. You have probably seen yes. that. Yes. And if it's an old lady and it's a big Rottweiler, it could yes. be impossible for her to drag the dog away from that spot. No, no chance. But hey, wouldn't that be beautiful if that was the reaction we was having from our dog on track? If I try to pull my dog that way, the dog says, bloody hell, I want to stay here. Yeah. The opposite reflex of the lease. No, uh, I mean, yeah. I, and I mean, that's not rocket science. We know it from obedience, but we don't use it on track. That's an excellent perspective. I, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. So how uh, and, would you go about, how about, so if there's a novice, you know, there's like a, I'm hoping a lot of novice people will hear this and they will, you know, gain some nuggets of information with this. So if somebody's starting completely brand new with their dog and they're into the sport, it's very easy to get discouraged with the amount of work there is in the sport. And there's not a lot of very supportive people, unfortunately. And that's just the reality of things. Everybody's, you know, kind of for themselves, except a few. So when there's a novice, like I would have loved to have all this infrastructure when I started, when I was like 10 years old, I would have loved to have all this Thankfully, there was no uh, internet back then when I was young. Otherwise, exactly. there was no chance. So uh, we uh, have so much information available, but yet we don't have something that is jumping out to people. So for somebody who's just starting with a new dog, with a green dog, with an experienced dog, how would you encourage them to stay in, let's say, just to make their dog and them love tracking? First of all, and maybe it's a little bit awkward. First of all, I will trying to ask people for reading the rule book. Read the rule book, read the rule book. Because yes. it's for free. And there's yes. a lot of knowledge. Because if you understand what the rule book says, you can yes. avoid a lot of bad training. Yes. Because a lot of bad training is making it even more difficult to make the trial. Yes. Uh, yes. And when I understand the rule book, then I start uh, building a lot of food drive up in my dog. And that mm -hmm. could be, uh, I could take a small amount of food, put it on the ground, and yes. then put a bungee on my dog, a bungee. Yes. And then let uh -huh. the dog eat, and then pull a little bit in the bungee. That's good. That's good. That's good. So the dog is fighting against that bungee down in the food. Yes. And later on, I put a really lease on the dog and do it on a lease mm -hmm. because it's a little mm -hmm. bit bigger pressure. And the dog yes. loves that game. Yes. And then I start digging small hole in the ground uh, for track. Uh, I'm not calling it track. I'm only calling it muscle memory, building up yes. a certain uh, situation for the dog. Yes. And I think also one of the most important things for me is when I'm so lucky, I have seminars, is to convince people about you don't need big track fields. Yes. I mean, everybody can uh, teach 80% in your backyard if you have a small backyard. Yep. A good example is I have a very, very small track in my backyard. I've used mm -hmm. the same track for two years now. Yep. I go out same. in the morning and reload the same footprint and bring my yep. dog there. It's only a muscle memory I'm teaching my dog in the first yep. place. Yep. And maybe um, don't listen too much to a lot of people on internet. <laughs> or at least investigate people who is trying to convince you about anything on internet. Because there's yes. a lot of funny things going on there. Yes, that's definitely true. <laughs> uh, would you mind sharing? You shared a story of you know from uh, from failure to success for your own personal uh, accomplishment with your dog as a as a competitor. 
as a coach, do you have any personal stories that you would like to share from your travels of the world? In which way? I don't know. I, I don't as know. A, as a coach mean. for one of your students. So, uh, you know, you shared your own personal story where you drew inspiration from Helmut Reiser and from six points to 21 points, you got a hundred point track at the national championship as a competitor. So as a coach, do you have any stories from your students that you would like to share or any experience that you had around the world that stood out to you? Well, 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 maybe the, 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 the most hard feeling story I can tell is uh, there was a young lady uh, from Sweden and she yes. was training with her first German Shepherd dog at all. And mm -hmm. she wanted to go for the ITP one. And mm -hmm. she was saying, OK, I would like to do it in Denmark, in a foreign country. And mm -hmm. she go there, and, and uh, the judge was saying to her on the track, that was the most beautiful track he ever had seen, ever. But the lease was touching the ground, so therefore he will take a point for each uh, leg, so he gave her a 97 point. And I said to the judge, hey, come on, the rule book says it's allowed the lease touch the ground. Yeah, And he said, he re replies to me, yeah, but if the lease is going down on the ground and the whole way through the dark hand and up, She's not 10 meters away from the dock. Okay. And I think, come on, come on. It's <laughs> a home trial. I was trying to push people away from the club. And we yes. were very disappointed. But she was, she was crying. But she was yes. a really fighter, that girl. Two weeks later, she go for the FH1 without lease and make 100 points. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. In your face to the judge. Because now the lease is not touching the ground. Agree? <laughs> So that was it. really a good story for me. Uh, to that hate, is wonderful. On, fight, fight for it. That, that, that was wonderful. actually the first time I saw for FH1 somebody make hundred point without a lease. Oh, that's brilliant! That's brilliant. Would you? Uh, you know, talking nobody... about that, if I can shortly talk about that. Yes, uh, please. Two, three days ago, there was a old friend of mine uh, from Denmark. I was talking with him, and he asked about all my seminars, and he was very much into. Oh, how many people have you put on uh, the world championship with your training? Sure, sure. And, uh, and we, I, I, I mentioned some people and we talk about it. And then suddenly I discovered that he was, he was measuring my success about how many people I was uh, able to put to the world championship. Yeah. And that's certainly not how it is for me. For yeah. me, it's exactly the same quality to help a person to get his one first ITV1 ever with a showline mm -hmm. dog. Yeah. They have to fight and fight and fight with that showline dog, with low drive, and finally they pass the trial for ITV1. Yes. That's the same success for me. No doubt yeah. about that. No doubt yeah, about yeah. that. They because like when they I can say, see uh -huh. the, 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 the feeling the and the happiness and all that, because they have struggled and they have fight hard. So I, I, I almost prefer that because I know they have struggled hard. Also, like the saying goes, I helped a man to climb a mountain and with him, I climbed the mountain too. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You have a point so, there. What, what do you uh, feel are the common challenges or obstacles that trainers or novice trainers face uh, or beginners face when teaching a dog to track and how would you overcome those? Uh, what do you mean exactly? What is the biggest problem? Yeah, the biggest obstacles. Well, one could be lack of knowledge or would one could be, uh, you know, thinking the not enough availability of land or whatever. But generally, in general, like when you're trying to motivate younger people or new people to get involved in the sport like tracking or the, uh, people from other side of the breed to get involved in the sport of tracking or in the phase of tracking in IGP. Uh, I'm not what sure about it. I, I'm not sure about that's the right answer I'm coming with now, but nevertheless, sure. I will try. Uh, sure. I notice that uh, when I'm coming to a club and uh, yes. I ask them, why have you invited me? They say, oh, we have seen one of your puppy track and we think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then I said to them, but hey, you have to know that puppy was maybe four or five months old you have seen on social media. That sure. puppy have maybe tracked 600 track. Yes. I mean, the biggest challenge I have that is to tell people how much they actually have to train. Yes. A lot of people is joining IGP sport, which for me is the highest level in the world. Yes. And they are training once a month. Yeah, or maybe no, once a week. 
Yeah, and that doesn't count. I'm sorry to say uh, that doesn't work like that. And no. it's like uh, very often I make a little bit joke out of it because I see a lot of people in IGP sport, they literally hate track. They love obedience and protection work, but they hate track. But I mean, would you ever consider to uh, join a triathlon competition if you can't swim? No, you will drown. Don't do it. Yes. It's stupid. And, yes. and it's the same uh, if your dog can't track. Why are you in IGP sport? Do uh, Go do French or something else? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, it don't make sense for me. So uh, hard work pays off, no doubt about that. But people must yes. also realize how much they have to train to get good result. Yes. And instead of being frustrated about not getting result, it's maybe just because you don't have the time for it. Sure. And then also I see a lot of people in the modern world, they have a lot of bad excuses all the time. I mean, in the north of the world, oh my God, it's freezing and snowing, we can't train. In the south, oh, we have fire ants, we can't train. In the <laughs> west, oh, it's the wind is blowing. In the east, oh, it's raining all the time. Hey, come on. <laughs> I mean, be creative. When I'm in Peru, we are tracking in the wet sand uh, near the Pacific yes. Ocean. Uh, yes. In the wintertime, why, why can you not track in snow? I mean, yeah. you can teach the, the dog the muscle memory, the right yes. behavior. Uh, why not? We have tracked inside horse houses during the wintertime in the sand. Why not? Yep. Yep. <clears throat> I know you are never going to the world champions level that way, but hey, that's a good start. Absolutely. So uh, what would you do to accommodate your training? Because uh, you have students that are from the very basic level, like just discovered you on social media. You know, the puppy looks really beautiful tracking. From those people all the way to the world championship level, from the first IGP one with a low drive dog to the highest podium in the world. How do you accommodate or change your training to accommodate all those people? Literally, I'm not doing that because uh, the way I'm tracking with dog is like a check system. I'm starting yes. with something and then I'm staying there. If you can compare it, if you have a kid in school, yes. one plus one is two. If you ask yes. the kid after the first day in school, what is one plus one? We know if the kids say three, hmm, maybe we should stay here until they say yes. the right answer. And yes. we don't know how long time that will take. It could take one second. It could take three years. We don't know. But yes. we know if we are leaving that, we will have trouble later. Sure. So, so uh, if I have an eight weeks old puppy, and I get a client's dog who's going to the world championship, it's the same level I'm training on, maybe. Yes. But the adult five years old dog going for the world championship, it's a checklist. If you can do that, check. If you can do that, check. If you can do that, check. But suddenly I find out, ah, that's your weak point. That's why you have yeah. all the problem. Yes. So could you iterate, could it be uh, talking about, you know, leash sensitivity, handler sensitivity, like we spoke about leash pressure, creating an aversion to put the head down, for example. And I, of course, like 99% of, of the people, I'm one of them. First of all, I'm spending a lot of time to building enough drive in the dog. Yes. But a lot of people, when we talk about track, it's afraid of drive because sure. they, they misunderstand the word drive on track because they think if we build drive on the dog, the dog runs to the end. Yeah. But, but who have said the drive had to go in that direction? We could teach the dog that drive is going in that direction. Couldn't that just be avoidance, You're trying to get to the end to finish it? Yeah, but it could also be where's the biggest reward. Yeah. Uh, the reward is typical at the end. We have a jackpot. Yeah, and it's absolutely. very often predictable because it's going straight out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a lot of small things about track. I, I put a smile on my face. Uh, a good example is if I'm tracking with a client, the dog will shoot the corner. The man correct the dog. I say, what are you doing? I'm correcting my dog because my dog will shoot the corner. Yes, I yeah. saw that. But yeah. uh, don't you think it was a coincidence that your dog was stopped tracking exactly in the corner? <laughs> and, and they say, what if the corner was showing up two meters before? Don't you think you will probably have the same issue? Well, yes. maybe. Yes. So if I'm literally could ask the dog, hey, what are you doing? You're not tracking. And then the dog will say, but I've not been tracking the last 10 paces. And if that's right, could you imagine how bad the timing is in correction of the dog? Yeah. How should the dog understand that? I mean, <laughs> could you imagine uh, in obedience, yes. you just hit exercise, the dog stay, and you wait until the sit down and kick the shit out of the dog? You bloody idiot, you missed the sit. 
But honestly, it's not rocket science. <laughs> Sorry. Great. <laughs> so how, how do we it's go about It's important for me to put laugh into the sport. It's very important. Yes. We need no, to I laugh. love it. I absolutely yeah. love it. <laughs> I want to just ask, though, <laughs> how do we figure out that 10 steps before when the dog stops tracking before the corner? What is the secret there? That's what I want to ask. The problem is... How do, how do we become Dr. Doolittle like you? The problem is we are tracking way too much straight out. Because yes. on the straight out lake, it's so easy. So we cannot yes. decide is the dog tracking or not tracking. It looks the beautiful. Checked out. Maybe the dog, the dog is not tracking. And if, if we all the time a miss a corner, then it's quite clear our dog was not tracking. So maybe yes. we should stop tracking straight out. Or let me put it another way. Uh, even if I have an IGP-3 dog, Mm -hmm. For every step I track straight out with that dog, it's a little bit like I'm cleaning the dog's hard disk because it's too easy. Remember, yes. the dog can indicate coronavirus. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so, so um, I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, let me put it this way. Maybe it makes make no sense. When I go for my ITP1, yes. that is the most easiest track ever for the yes. dog. Yes. I mean, straight out, leg corner, straight out, corner, boom. Yeah. Until then, they have been much, much, much more difficult for the dog. I've challenged the dog much more. And mm -hmm. I all the time have that sentence feeling when my dog indicated the last article to a trial. When I go to my dog, the dog is looking at me and say, hey, you was fooling me. That was the easy track <laughs> today. And then I have to con convince the dog about the next two, three months. It's not easy. Yes. It will never be easy again. I promise you, it was a coincidence. Yeah, yeah. Because we only trick uh, them on the trial day. Exactly. Ex yes. And because spot on, spot on, that is exactly what we know in obedience. Yes. But but Precisely. on track, it's a little bit like no, no, it's a naturally tracker. Not for me. It's it's I'm, yeah. it's fake. I'm faking. Should I hope my IGP dog is sitting. Dog, yeah. I hope my dog is sitting in front of the flag to the trial and say, "Oh my God, I have to concentrate because it's very difficult," and it's not difficult to the trial. But then the judge said, nice concentrated dog. Yes. <laughs> He's waiting for the difficulty to come. Exactly. It will come. It will come. It will come. It will come. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And what do you think, in your opinion, are the most crucial elements for success in a competitive tracking event? Uh, let's say at a national championship or an international championship like the world's. And how would you help your students and yourself first and then your students excel like you did in the Danish championship with a perfect track? How would you help uh, yourself or the students set them up for success? Uh, well, now I'm an old, a little bit more relaxed guy. But when I was younger, I could be very, very upset about yes. the difference between the judges. Yes. And how a lot of judges was not judging regarding to the rule book. Yes, it happens all the time. Yeah, but but now I'm getting a little bit more round and easy going. Uh, and we have to admit, as long as it's human being who's judging us, it will yes. be like this. Yes. But I would love that. And I know all judges, every time that they are going to meeting, they learn that they cannot take any point from the dark handler before the flag. And they yes. cannot take any point after the last article. Yes. But a lot of my young, young clients, they are so concerned about how they should report into the judge, how that should look. And I'm so sick of tired of that instead of, hey, come on, show a good track. Let's see that instead of how the dog is reporting in. And the rule book is quite clear about it. Yes. There is no point there. They can disqualify you if your dog is out of control. And I respect that, of course. Of course. But sure. hey, how the obedience is... Hey, no, that's don't, don't kill all the driving because all my clients is killing the drive and the dog before they even yeah. reach to the flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also, uh, I would love that a lot of people understand how big challenge the dog actually can can take on track if they challenge the dog. But a lot mm -hmm. of people is going themselves is going on automatic pilot. They do yes. the same day after day after day after day. I, I, I can give you a good example. The last Please. seminar I was having a live seminar, uh, 10 clients. I said to them, Please lay a track. And they put a flag and they track straight out, lay the track straight out. 
as a beginning. And then they bring the dog from the car and then they go directly to the flag and start tracking straight out. 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. And then I said to them, for me, that would be the same as if you was going to the car and said to your dog before you have to track, hey, dog, are you ready to track? And the dog said, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Uh, but, we, but you must promise me one thing, dog. What? You must not concentrate. What? No, yeah. you must not concentrate, dog. Because now I have done the best I can to teach you not to concentrate because it's going straight out and we are posting the flag straight out. And I have done that last week, last year, two years, three years. I'm going straight out, straight out, straight out, straight out, straight out. And I post the flag straight out. So I could might as well tell the dog, don't you dare to concentrate. And yeah. I mean, you could at least approach the flag from different sides. So the dog have to start like that, like an angle. So the dog have to concentrate from the first footprint. And I mean, that's not rocket science. We know it. No. Everybody knows it. Very often when I have track seminars, I'm telling people a lot of track they never heard about before on track, but they know it already. Yeah. Uh, they know it for mobility and some protection work. I mean, uh, one of the big issues for me is the lease. If a lease is tight, a tight lease for me on track, regardless to where it is, a tight lease yeah. for me is poison, is poison. Because all dog will pull harder in a tight lease. Yes. And if Opposite you don't believe force. me, exactly. Try to teach your dog a back transport in a tight lease. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, 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 uh, a lot of it is logically, but a lot of people is doing what some have told them without questioning them. Why? Yes. I spend a lot of time with all my clients trying to say to them, please remember to question me. Why, 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 why all the time? Because yeah, I yeah, must yeah. be able to give you a good explanation or else don't believe me. Then it's bullshit what I'm saying. Yes. No, absolutely. It cannot be gospel. If it's gospel, it means nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and then please don't see the great solution in buying more delicious food on track. I'm a sorry, can you repeat that, please? Don't see the only solution on track that is only to buying more delicious food. Sure. I see people showing up with salmon on track uh, because then my dog is tracking better. Hey, yeah, until now. But next week, the dog say, no, now I want diamond or cocaine or whatever it is. <laughs> Throughout this conversation, I, 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 I keep getting personally attacked by you for some reason. Yeah, but that's how it is. I know it. But that's because yeah. it's easy and convenient for, for yeah. the modern people. Yeah, I've done the same thing, the same stupid yeah. mistakes. So we got to find this particular food to track. Oh, he likes this more. This time yeah. we'll try the herring formula. This time we will try the lamb formula. Oh, been there, done that. Exactly. And, and, and then we start panic, jumping, yes. jumping, and jumping. Yeah. Yes. And the dog is sitting in the car and laughing. So, <laughs> bring diamond, <laughs> bring cocaine, bring caviar. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I, haven't, I hadn't had caviar till very recently. And I had given as a track reward to my dog caviar. I promise yeah. you. Yeah. You On see. the article. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can we discuss the importance of teamwork between the dog and the handler in tracking competitions and laying the fundamentals between the team? Well, how should I put it? Um, of course, the better you know your own dog, the better sure. it is to train with that uh, specific dog. Uh, but but I think <clears throat> with when I mean, but that's a cliche. That's a cliche thing to say. You know, like I would, would like to give you a little bit of pushback. Like, yeah, of course, if you know your dog, but what does that entail? Yes, but a, a good uh, a good example about that is if you see a dog on a straight out leg tracking, the difference between people who's watching it, the judge and you and me, and the dog handler is very often the dog handler know his own dog so he can feel the intensity in the dog. So we can question him, are your dog tracking now or is it not tracking? We cannot decide it. Yes. I, I'll give you, uh, I want to point something out. I recently, I heard, like I've heard this a million times. Oh, the dog's being so stubborn. The dog's being so stupid. The dog's just doing this. The dog's never doing this. The dog is, the reason you're saying the dog is being stubborn is because you cannot read your own dog. 
the dog is just confused from what you want from the dog. And you yes. are maybe confused to tell the dog what you want from the dog. And now you blame the dog or the yes. track or the environment. Yeah, but it's very easy to blame the dog all the time. Yes. And, and of course, when we talk about track, uh, fairness is very important for me. Yes. Uh, you can imagine how many times I've seen people uh, correcting the dog quite hard. Yes. And there was no reason to correct the dog because the dog was on the track, but the person could yes. not remember where the track was. Oh. And I mean, uh, yeah. first rule is we must know where the track is. Yes. So, and if we don't know it, then we must make it more simple. And hey, come on, I'm so old. I'm smoking way too much weed. My memory is smashed. So I maybe just make one corner on my track because, and then I make 10 tracks the same day uh, because I can remember one corner. I cannot remember five corners. Uh, right. But admit it, be honest. Uh, yes. Instead of kicking the shit out of the poor dog. Yes. It's not okay. Yes. No, I agree. That's great. <laughs> and how, how would you foster trust and confidence between the dog and the team? What would, would be like some exercises, let's say, we make for some people? That, hey, it's, if you do this generally, this will help you. It's it's very interesting because I, I spend a lot of time trying to teach people to understand there must be a balance between, and that's up to the dog handler, there must be a balance between self-confidence in the dog and correctness. Because on track, regardless to, uh, compared to obedience, in obedience, we help the dog with a lot of commands. Yes. I mean, let's give me an ex give you an example. Uh, in the one meter hurdle, when you make the dumbbell work, you have five commands. Yep. You are starting, fuss. Yep. Jump. You're not even saying bring. You're saying jump, so the dog yep. is jumping. Yeah. Bring. Bring. Yep. The dog, uh, sit in front of you. Aus. Fuss. Yeah. That's five commands. Yep. Yep. I mean, on track, the dog has to decide to indicate an article all by itself with no command, yes. or yes. take the track to the right or the left. Yes, And what I mean about that is in the old days, we was correcting dog for, let's say, if the dog will shoot the corner with that distance. Yeah, but if I'm doing that nowadays, I'm killing all the self-confidence in the dog. And if I'm doing that, so, can you hear me? Yes, sorry, it cut out for a second. Okay. Uh, in the old days, we didn't accept any mistakes. Yes. We correct the dog for that distance. But then we yes. take also all the self-confidence away from the dog. And if we do yes. that, then when you go for a trial, especially when you're tracking without lease, then when yes. the dog owes you the corner a little bit, the dog, oh, oh, I don't know what to do. Then the yes. dog starts uh, pretending tracking, panic, yes. laying on the back, giving up, whatever. Yes. Yes. So that's a balance. And I mean, uh, compared to the old days, nowadays, when we talk about that and the dog handler and the dog, the co cooperation between those two, yes. if let's say official track layers footprint, there's 60 centimeters between the footprint. Yes. For me, and if I learn my dog to go from footprint to footprint, then yeah. for me, it will be logically that I must accept that my dog overshoot, overshoot sorry, 60 mm -hmm. cent uh, centimeters on a corner before the dog realizes, oh, there's no more footprint. Because, right. of course, the dog will go for the next footprint. Oh, of course. there's no more footprint. Okay, bad. Where is it? Okay, it's there. That right. means if I go to a trial and my dog is literally having the back legs in all the corners, but the judge is taking a lot of point for that, so beat it. Yes. Because I cannot teach my dog to do that better. Because yes. that will not be logically. No. But my dog will fight to die for that track and because yes. the self-confidence is high. And I'm yes. very often talking a lot about that. It's, it's up to the dog handler. I have some dog yes. handlers. They cannot accept it. Okay, cool. But then you also is so much on the edge of what the dog is able to do. So you're killing that self-confidence. So if your dog is in deep trouble, the dog will give up. Yes. It's a balance. And nowadays, the judge wants to see an open-minded dog on track who is not yes. under too big pressure. Yes. So it's actually very interesting. So how would you uh, advise somebody to start their puppy? Let's say somebody bought a new puppy uh, from a breeder and they have, you know, they want to do sport with their dog and they want to lay a foundation of tracking and grow the dog up in tracking. How would you advise them, the, those people, to start their puppy? 
first advice, take the football and throw it away. Yep. Don't have a football. Yep. The dog can get food from the track, on article, or in obedience. Yep. People very often ask me, oh, do you love to track last? No, I hate it. I hate to track. But I make a deal with my puppy. You only get food on the track. So if I don't track, the dog will die. Yeah. So of course <laughs> I have to track. It's quite simple. <laughs> and, 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 and talking about that, uh, I can get a little bit upset when I start talking about it, but I can might as well say it here. If yes. people is buying a working dog, regardless to the breed, a working dog, yes. and they give that dog food for free, yes. that's animal abuse. That's animal abuse. To give the dog food for free, that is cruel, very cruel. And if you don't believe me, try to call the local zoo and ask them how much time and money they spent teaching the beer to find honey in a tree or the monkey to find the vegetables or fruit in a labyrinth because they know there we must do that for them. Mot mo motivate the mind. Yeah. And, but people, they buy a very fancy working line dog and give the dog food for free. I don't get it. It's not good for the dog. It's not good for you. And why do you have that dog then? You are bought that dog because it's uh, for training. Then when I throw that food ball away, I give all the food in limit uh, space, I, uh, sorry, in limit portion. I mean, I all the time have a leash on my dog, throw the food on the ground, let the dog eat, and then I pull the dog slowly away from the food before the dog finish eating. Mm -hmm. So the dog say, I want more, I want more. No, no, sorry, you can't have it. And then maybe I do it two, later, two hours later again. Yes. So the dog learn nothing is for granted, nothing is for free. I have to fight for it. But Existential. if I fight hard, I can get it. Existential behavior. That praise it exactly. Yeah. Uh, and and I think it's very very important that people do that with the puppy, because sure. when they are older, they will do that for the rest of the life, right? Like idiots Absolutely. from the food. Right. So how do you wean your dog off? Let's say because of course in the trial, actual trial, we have no food. How do you wean your dog off the food for the track? In which way do you mean? So of course in the trial we have no food in the trial. Yeah. There is yeah. no there's no help for the dog. The dog must follow the footsteps, however natural or unnatural it might be. We, this is the exercise we have. Follow the footsteps, find the article till the end of the track. Take the corners, yeah. whatever. How yeah. do you start to take away the food from the track? For those well, puppies that you created the anticipation. Talk, maybe talk button. about patterns, talk about patterns that we create. It's actually the same as you're doing an obedience in the healing. People is walking with food in the hand mm -hmm. here in modern yes. healing. Yes. How long time are they doing that? You take it away gradually. You take yes. it step by step, away, away, away. And it's the same for me with the food. But yes. at the same time, the dog is introduced to a little bit negative reinforcement on track. So the dog figure out to put my nose down. That's very nice. It's a yes. pleasant feeling to bang my nose down in the ground. The yes. food is also very delicious. But, yes. but let's say if I'm doing like that in a flat collar and the dog mm -hmm. fight down and take the food and the leash get loose, if I one month later can do that a little bit harder and the dog still fight down, mm -hmm. the dog get a reward. But the dog also figure out if I fight down here, I get rid of that unpleasant feeling from the lease. Yeah. Popping in the lease. Yeah, that yeah. means later on, I can pop hard in the lease and the dog will, by nature, bang the nose to the ground. Yes. Because the dog expects food, but also because the dog wants to get rid of the unpleasant feeling. Yes. So in that way, I have introduced a little bit negative reinforcement. Yes. And, and course, I mean, it's become, it becomes a positive because the negative is leading the dog to the reward. Yes. And to the trial, when there's no food, there's arson. Then the dog's hunting a little bit more for the article. Because mm -hmm. I've teached my dog that the article is actually a safety spot. Because mm -hmm. the track later on is pressure for the dog, pressure, pressure, mm -hmm. pressure, pressure, pressure. But the article is the safety spot for the dog. Yes. And when the dog feels that pressure on the track to the trial because there's no food, then the dog will love the article even more. Yes. Of course, the speed will maybe go a little bit up in hunting, hunt drive for the article. Yeah. But that's okay sure. for me. Yes. So could you be, uh, so talk about a little bit more for the novices about the perceived pressure in the hunting behavior and the article being a safe spot. 
for, for, for me, it is like if you see traditional training on an article, you see a dog track, dunk, 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 and then the dog stop one split second on the article and continue tracking. That's a typical yes. behavior you see when the dog overshoot an article. Yes. Okay. So the dog is tracking, mm -hmm. and the dog stop at the article and continue tracking. Yes. For me, that's quite logically. The dog is seeing, saying, mm, I prefer to track. Yes. But what are we doing in that situation, typical, if the dog tries to wish you with the article? People are correcting the dog to bring him back to the article. So do we really think that that will make the article more interesting? No, it would make it more aversive. So now the dog started avoiding the article. Yeah, you created, you increased your problem. Yes, so, so uh, I try to switch that around and say, if I put pressure on the track, it's like in the beginning, pop food, pop food, pop food, pop food. And then slowly I can pop a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder. Not so hard so the dog give up, but so the dog feel the pressure. But when the yeah. dog then indicate the article, lose leaves a lot of happiness on the article. Then yes. my dog see the article as a little bit like um, a bell, you know, yes. uh, say by the bell in the boxing match. Sure. Oh my God. I mean, if I hear a bell ring, it doesn't affect me. But if I hear the same bell ring and I'm boxing against Mike Tyson, I would love to hear that bell. If you make it to the bell. Exactly. Exactly. But suddenly <laughs> I can hear the bell even if it's not there. Hey, Mike, can you hear the bell? I can hear it. Yeah. Or the 10 second clapper before the round ends, before 10 seconds, they have a clapper that goes exactly. off that marks oh, 10, more, I, I, 10 more minutes. Yeah. Now you sprint. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but but I but 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 for me it's important that we understand the balance between article and track. When the yes. dog or shoot an article, it's because the dog prefers to track. Yeah. Yes. But what are we what are we rewarding with on track? Food. What are yes. we rewarding with when the dog indicated the article? Food. Yeah. But yes. why should the dog then lay down in the wet grass? The dog could say, "I can just continue tracking the food right on the other side of the article." Yeah. 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 But if we start playing that mental game, that pressure mm -hmm. and no pressure. Mm -hmm. The dog will see the article as a kind of relief. Yes. And would I've you advise... Of... Go ahead, sorry. No, no, sorry. I said, uh, would you advise, let's say, introducing a toy in that situation, in that scenario, to take the stress off the dog for the article? Uh, the problem with a lot of uh, things the dog handler is doing, uh, giving chores, a ball, or whatever it is, is very often that the dog is starting putting more attention to the dog handler than to the yard yes. or the track. Yes. Because the dog the say, hey, you have the cocaine in your pocket. Ah, bring yes. it to me. So the yes. dog start laying crooked on the article and turn around yeah. or come back to you. Yeah, uh, yeah, general, yeah. general, when we talk about track, I prefer to be a small person. So mm -hmm. uh, if you understand what I mean about that, uh, yes. Yes. in obedience, me and the dog is working together. In protection mm -hmm. work, it's a battle between my dog and the helper. On yes. track, it's a battle between the field and my dog. Yes. So on track, I'm actually a little person. I'm not yes. interfering so much. Yes. Independent but if the track picture. can do it, yeah. But if the track can do it, I, I love it. Mm -hmm. So please expand on that. But then uh, if I put more and more pressure before the article, the dog say, yes. fuck, 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 fuck. Oh, there is the article and dog indicate the article. And if the dog understands that, how to release the pressure on the article spot, then yes. I suddenly don't need to reward so much on the article because the yes. dog knows it's a safety spot here. So but, you... if I, but if I do mm -hmm. it too much, it's mm -hmm. difficult for me to start the dog again. The dog says, yes. bloody hell, I'm staying here. I don't want yeah. to leave here because the pressure on yeah. the track is too much. But then I have a certain balance in it, the balance between yes. pressure on track and pressure on the article. So what I'm trying to ask is how would you create the pressure on the track to enforce the article? And so the article is that island for the dog. Popping in the lease, popping harder okay. and harder and harder and harder. Okay. I mean, if you have, it's in the future, it's not in the beginning, but let's yes. say uh, the last five footprint before the article, you have uh, pieces of food. On the first piece yes. of food, you pop like this. Yes. The next piece of food, you pop like that. The yeah. And you pop harder and harder, so the dog is almost about to give up tracking. Sure, dog, okay. Oh, my God, yes. but there is the article. Oh, my God, saved by the bell. I love that safety spot. Right. But, but you again, cannot do that during the, the whole track. 
you can do no. that in the last five, six footprint before the Arctic. Yes, yes. And then again, the uh, point comes that the dog must completely understand what the article is, what behavior is expected, yeah. and you must know where your article is. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> all the time, all the time, all the time. But, but going back to the I, same point. Yeah. And then uh, before we end, uh, um, uh, a very important thing for me is also when I train track is as soon as possible when I track with a dog, introduce the dog for problem, which means for me, provocate the dog to miss the track and tell mm -hmm. the dog that's not okay. And when mm -hmm. the dog go back to the track by itself, praise the dog a lot. Yep. I mean, you have probably seen that in the future. Uh, people is uh, in the past, sorry, in the past. Yes. People tracking with two leaves under the belly like this. Have you seen that? Yes, I've seen I have that. Done that. I have done that too. But for yeah. me, I will never do that again because mm -hmm. it looks beautiful. You get very fast, a good result. But the dog never learns to deal with problem because we have yes. the steering wheel. It's like yes. we have a joystick up in the ass of the dog almost. Yes, uh, yes. So the dog never learns to deal with problem. I want yes. the dog to deal with problem and understand yes. I can do it. It's not optimal. I'm on the dark side. I have to fix that, but I can fix it actually. Absolutely. So when so when my dog is leaving the track, going out of the track, I'm never ever pulling the dog back to the track. I'm putting sure. slightly pressure on the dog and then I show the uh -huh. good alternative. Yes. And then I maybe encourage the dog. I'm luring the dog to go over to that piece of food I have over here until so the dog goes yeah. over. And immediately when the dog goes over, I let go of the pressure and pet the dog yes. and say, that was good. So yes. we are fooling the dog to believe, hey, you can do it yourself. You can change yes. it from bad to good. Yes. Why I want to reiterate what you mean by pressure is so people understand that it's not you're creating, your aversive is not like you're punishing the dog. You're just saying, hey, this is more interesting than what your mistake you're about to make. Yeah. And uh, while we're talking about that, it's also important you have a lot of clients in the United States. Uh, I see all tons of clients over there with the prong colors and e colors. Yeah, uh, yeah but, but well, that's how it is, and and I I I love all that, but sorry to say, sooner or later we have to take it away again. Yes, you're not allowed and, it in the trial. No, and I see a lot of dog being addicted to a prong collar. Where? Yeah, I don't think they need it. So why yeah. use a prong collar if you don't really need it? Because if the handler is very easy. The yes, but you get very easy uh, addicted to it, yes. and then the dog is learned to lean forward until the dog feels the prong. And if the dog yeah. is doing that for the trial, the dog is leaning forward. No prong today. Yo, yeah. make make me. <laughs> uh, so so, it's not because I'm against prong collars and e collars, but mm, I've, I've taken away from so many dogs in the states. Yeah. So I want to be mindful of your time and I want to ask you that one last question. How do you perceive the challenges of prejudice faced by working dogs that serve humanity in our constantly evolving society? And what do you see as the significance of preserving these dogs and these bloodlines and the role of IGP sport and our role as enthusiasts in the sport in breeding these dogs and taking them into the future for the future generations? Whoa, that was a big one. Keep the best for last. Guide me a little bit through it. Help me. So as our society is changing every single day, we're, yeah. you know, we're seeing yeah. the society was a lot rougher. We can call yeah. them, you know, the silent generation that went to war. Then we had the Gen Xers. Then we had the Gen Z. and We have the Gen Generation Y, Generation Z, so on and so forth. People are getting more and more absorbed in their screens. Lit literally testosterone levels in men are dropping yeah. each generation has lesser phthalates in our food just like this like our society is completely changed from what it was 50 years ago yeah. the I'm men very, 50 I'm... years ago are different the dogs 50 years ago are different we had dogs like mink and pharaoh 50 years ago we don't see a lot of those dogs today for instance no. and we had even like just a few years ago we had dogs like yavir we don't have many dogs like that today you're right. You're right. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, of course, concerned about that because let, uh, for me, because I've been in sport for 40 years, IGP have been the foundation for the breeding, if you ask me. Yes. Yes. It is still, uh, we are going to the German Nationals, Bundesliga breeding, yes. to watch the dog, see them, all that. But that's uh, the holy grail. Yes. And it's still 
But yes. how long time will it be that? I mean, yes. we don't have the stick here anymore. We can discuss we, that. What is that ruined? We, we, just, uh, I don't know. we just we just dodged the bullet with the Austrians banning all bike sports. It's already banned in Australia. You cannot have uh, IGP in Australia. In and many it's states. like that. And it's like that all the time. I mean, the last yeah. 20 years, I have never not seen any, any change make it more difficult, the dog sport. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have all the time the opposite. Then you're not allowed to do this. Then you're not allowed to do that. Now they want we're to ban asking, the... We're asking for more... Endur- like- I heard I the endurance test. They are, they are, they are, they are banding that now. I, I mean, oh my oh, god! Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> you are so, not allowed to bicycle twenty kilometers with your dog. <laughs> I I want to push back a little bit uh, on the IGP being a breed test because the breed test, as far as the obedience and the protection is concerned, has evolved quite a bit from when it used to be a breed test when we were testing for drives. Then it became testing for handling. Now, when you're looking at a scorebook for a, a V-score dog, I think you're going breeding to the handler and not the dog. It's because the strongest dogs are not making those high V points in obedience because the obedience is so precise. If a yeah, dog, yeah. if we need yeah, yeah. a headstrong dog in protection that gives 110% to fighting the helper, that dog is not making 100 points in the obedience. No, I, I agree with you, but I think it has been like that for many years already. Yes, I mean, of course. You, if you only, uh, or else it would be very easy just to breed with the winner. But, yeah, that's, but, it, but that's it's, what it's, most people are doing to sell puppies. It's like I breed with the, in the show lines, I breed to the VA dog and I get VA dogs and in the working lines, I breed to the podium dog with super high scores and I will get the next podium yeah. dog. So, so both you and me know that's wrong. That's not how it yeah. works. But it's interesting to see how it will change now. But, but you know what? Uh, the dog is maybe getting softer because of the the test and uh, of the dog is getting softer. But the society is also getting softer. So they yeah. require softer dogs. Sure. I mean, uh, the the I mean, no offense, but the young policeman today he can maybe not handle the dog the policeman could handle for twenty years ago. Uh, sure. No, or, no, absolutely. We are not allowed that the dog is biting in public. People are the same way as the dog was biting in the criminal for 20 years ago today. Yeah. So, so maybe everything is doing like that. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think a lot, of, a lot of strong dogs will get put down today. Yeah. Because they will not be deemed safe for society. And that I think that is disturbing to me. I think we and owe I, it more to our dogs than that. Uh, I feel as a society. Yeah, yeah, you are probably right. It's but but it's very difficult, and and I don't know what to do. Or, uh, and, and you know how big problem we have in Europe. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm sorry to say, it's only a matter of time. Shores. You will have them too. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I'm afraid it will come to our shores as well, yeah. because with the yeah. liability and stuff, I think the problem is a lot bigger in America with personal yeah. liability, etc. Yeah. But the government taking action. Like that's the problem always yeah. with these big government countries, small countries with big governments is the governments yeah. are very swift to take action. We yeah. have a huge country and the government is thankfully not very effective. So the change is not very quick, no. which is and not I'm, the I'm, case in Europe. I can give you a good example. Uh, last year I was in North Carolina. I was having a seminar and I was asking for a puppy uh, because I want to show something with a puppy. And there was a nice lady. She was breeder of boxers. And she was sure. bringing a box of puppy with cropped ears and they have a uh, tape up the ears. And I tried yes. with that puppy and it was a super puppy, very nice puppy. And they took uh-huh. some pictures and some video and put it on social media. Oh mm-hmm. my God. I was cropping. almost banned in Denmark because of the cropping of the ears. Come on. I'm in the United States. It's a puppy who have cropped ears. Stop. Stop. Uh, but that's how it is. Yeah, that, that, that it's... Uh... Well, so what do you think we could do to, you know, mitigate that or maybe slow that down? How would you go about educating the people uh, or have some ideas that we can introduce to the general public to show that we are not the bad guys, that we actually care for the preservation of these dogs? Uh, I'm sorry to say, but I think right now it's important that we are pleasing them a little bit don't put too many pictures of too aggressive dog uh, on social media or too uh, dogs biting uh, all kind of places on the people and and don't put too many prong collars and e-collars because so we are majority we're majority i i mean it uh, even if you were right we can fight against our right but come on the public is much bigger so I- and stronger than we are 
are we placating to the people that think chocolate milk comes from brown cows and normal milk comes from white cows? Yeah, you see my point? Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's delicate. I, I, yeah. It's maybe also because I'm getting older and say, hey, come on. <laughs> yes. I'm dead. No, I'm, uh, I want to be very away. clear and say I'm all, only for the fair treatment of dogs and only for the right, just treatment of dogs. And I'm just afraid that in this world, I don't want to lose our German Shepherd breed that becomes just like a museum piece. I want our dogs to be real dogs to be able to do real jobs. Not everybody, everyone who has a dog that sits on their couch is not good for catching the criminal. Like you see videos of all the time of the police dog, the guy says, for on, and the dog's like, no, I go this way. No, but 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 then again, I will also say when we talk about the working lines, at, at least German Shepherd, yes. I still see a lot of super good dogs, very good oh, dogs. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But again, it's uh, like the corner is ten paces ahead. Yeah, yes, but but we have we have talked about that for many years. Yes, but but yeah, it will be interesting to see in the future. But can we mitigate it somehow, I and not say... just be bystanders? I will say the biggest challenge is that the people who are selecting dog for breed must yes. be better and better and better and better to see that, to see the, the, the right dog. Because yes. a good dog trainer can cover the dog in, in, in good training so the dog looks like a million. Absolutely. Would you like to add anything to that uh, in the end with close, for closing? I don't know what that should be. Uh, well, since this track we are talking about, I think it's important to say that that it's interesting for me to see on track that is the the score on track to big competition is where most people is failing. Yes, but it's at the same time the place where most people make B. Yes, it's very interesting. Yes. So when you know the big spectrum there is in track, maybe people should put much more time into track. I agree with you, most definitely, sir. I yeah. appreciate your time very much. Thank you for taking the time to do this and having a conversation for the general public. Um, and I hope you understand my bad English. I'm trying the best I can. Oh, you are great. Your English is better than my Danish, so we're good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I really, really appreciate you taking the time to do this and I hope we can do it again in the future. I'm very happy for being here. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a nice Take day. Care. Bye. You as Bye. well. Take care.